So it's great to be able to speak to you uh, today during lunch. I have the distinct uh, pleasure to be uh, moderating or facilitating this uh, Innovators and Disruptors panel. And um, I think that uh, PJ and MR asked me to do this because I talk and write a lot about innovation, right? Is that, uh, that's, that's fair? And also because I'm young, right? No? no? OK, OK, one out of two. I got one out of two right. So what we've heard uh, over the past two days is you know, risk management, issues around risk management. We've talked about opportunity. We've talked a little bit about the, uh, the, the role of opportunity and innovation. And we heard Hannah talk about that last night. So it was great to, to hear about that. Uh, and Neil Hawkins yesterday uh, quoted from a, a Broadway play. So uh, very bold, Neil, wherever you are, very bold. Uh, I'm going to quote from an old uh, uh, satirical work, uh, Knickerbocker's History of New York, to kick this off. And it's, oh, the world, the world, all the world knows the world of trouble that the world is eternally occasioning. And that was from a blog post that I wrote. I, I used that a blog post here a few years ago called Knickers in a Twist. And uh, yes, I got it published on our blog site, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, the idea was opportunity versus risk. So today, uh, I had the pleasure to have four young innovators and disruptors that are going to be joining me on stage for a conversation. And uh, I think you're going to be uh, engaged. I think you'll be uh, pumped up from what you hear from them. And, uh, and so uh, I, I, I look forward to the conversation. Uh, we're going to have Brent Schulkin uh, from uh, uh, Carrot Mob join us. We're going to have Rich Matsui from KWH Analytics. We will have Johnny Cohen from uh, uh, Green Shields Initiative. I always want to say company. And we will have uh, Param Jaggi from Eco Ecoviate uh, join us uh, and talk. So if you guys would, come on up stage and we'll have a conversation. They're already changing up. They're coming from the other side. I was expecting them over here. How are you doing? Welcome. So in order to kick this off, we're going to have each of, uh, each of you speak just a few minutes about what your company is or what the initiative that you're working on is. And, and probably the simplest way to do it is just to go down the line. So Brent, if you would, uh, if you will start and tell us a little bit about Carrot Mob. Sure. So I'm Brent. I am the founder of Carrot Mob. And <clears throat> Carrot Mob is crowd buying for social good. And the way that it works is we aggregate consumers and get a bunch of people together and say, we're all going to go spend money at a business to support this business. And in exchange, the business is going to take an action uh, that we care about, do something on sustainability, something good. And so we're sort of rewarding them for, for doing that. So for example, uh, this started with very grassroots community events where we would say, in a, in a small community, let's get a few hundred people, we're gonna go to a, a small a restaurant or a hardware store, some small business, spend a few thousand dollars, and then in exchange, the business says, hey, we're gonna start a recycling program, or you know, maybe we'll do some community sustainability project, or switch to compostable bags, or whatever, whatever it may be. So that idea has gone on to grow into this, this global movement. We've had hundreds of these campaigns in communities around the world in over 20 countries, uh, and as a movement, we've spent about a million dollars at this point, so it's really taken off. And what we're looking to do is, is see how we can apply that same idea to big brands. So if you imagine a, a retailer in the room, uh, what would it look like if we did a, a national campaign and we said, all right, we've got all of our people, we're going to drive you know, traffic to go spend money at, at your stores, and in exchange you do some large scale, you know, some, support some large scale uh, improvement. And so for the Carrot Mob movement is really based around this idea that people want to vote with their money and they want their purchase to have meaning and to have an impact and to get that positive feedback when they swipe their card, like I know that I just created a, a change. Um, and, and so that's what gets people so excited about this. And of course, businesses love it because we're driving sales, giving them new customers, great marketing. Um, so yeah, what we're all about is trying to build a win-win movement of consumers spending money to reward the businesses that, uh, that deserve it. It's a, it's, a, it's a great take on doing uh, well by doing good, right? So I mean, that, exactly. that, that, that tried into expression. Param, if you can tell us a little bit about, uh, about your initiative. 
Yeah, so uh, my name's Ram Jaggi, working on um, a startup called Ecoviate. So uh, we're focusing on disposable green technologies. Um, when, when I was younger, when I was uh, about 12, 13 years old, I started doing um, lab research. And um, from an early age, I realized that the big, one of the biggest problems with the, the field is that it's really hard to get very innovative technologies into the hands of the, um, the, the, the common American. Um, so I, I took the approach to make t these technologies uh, completely disposable, um, make them very inexpensive um, and efficient to use. So uh, there's a, that additive environmental and um, energy aspect to our technologies. Um, right now we're dealing with a, um, a patented technology um, that it actually just came through uh, about a couple months ago after about three or four years of waiting. Um, it's a device that fits on the exhaust of motor vehicles that uh, reduces carbon dioxide emissions. Um, basically creating a bioreactor made out of uh, algae and acid base production um, for the exhaust of motor vehicles. So uh, the device costs us a little under $10 to make, um, reduces emissions by around 50 to 60 percent. And um, I mean, what we're trying to do is implement these on hopefully every car in the world and uh, try to do damage control on um, existing pollution and uh, the greenhouse gas effect. Um, we, we, basically, we, we basically created a an ecosystem and an environment in the company that um, encompasses around this idea that um, it's pretty hard to change the world if you don't have a planet to live on. So um, we're, we're working on technologies that um, not only have a social good and uh, an environmental impact, but um, are consumer friendly and give a consumer an added incentive. Um, so on um, actually coming up on July 15th, we are launching a Kickstarter for our, um, for our product to hopefully get get these on um, onto the motor vehicles around, around the country. Well, you just answered one of my questions because I was going to ask you about Kickstarter, uh, all of you, so uh, that's, that's good to know. Uh, Johnny, uh, would you tell us about uh, yours? Sure. So I invented Green Shields, and Green Shields is an aerodynamic add-on for school buses, and it reduces the amount of fuel that they use and um, makes them more aerodynamic. and. I've been researching this at Northwestern University for the past three years. Um, I thought of the idea when I was in seventh grade, and I kind of um, just thought that school buses should be more efficient because they, um, you just think of them as big, really boxy um, cars that you can draw really well just with um, 90 degree angles and straight lines. So <laughs> that's not the best way to design a car. So. Um, school buses shouldn't be exempt from that either. So what you're saying is school bus design came from somebody that drew it when they were young and they were doing blocks <laughs> and they never innovated past that is what Well, um, school buses were, I guess, they're efficient um, in itself because it's carpooling rather than having, um, I don't know, 80 so parents drive to school. It's having one inefficient bus, but that's way more efficient than um, 80 other cars driving. Um, and also, they've been focused around on safety, but uh, school bus service providers, um, which provide the school bus service to school districts, uh, have been allocating all their school buses in large bus yards. And so school buses, um, people think that aerodynamics don't matter for them because they only travel I don't know, less than 30 miles per hour, but they actually go on the highway to get to their routes. And school bus service providers uh, keep them in one lot so that they can fix them. And I don't know, um, and they go out to quite large distances on highways. And so um, it's very similar to semi truck add ons and uh, for school buses. Thank you. Rich, tell us about KWH Analytics. Sure, sure. So we are a data aggregation analytics company for the solar industry. And so there's actually never been a company which has taken all that energy production data being spun off all these thousands of solar farms now across the US and put all that data in one place and then analyze it to learn you know, what's going on with these solar farms. You know, are, is there a difference between various panel brands? Um, do these things last for 25 years or 25 minutes when you put them out in the field? I mean, there's a lot of very, very basic questions that our industry just hasn't answered using actual field data. So that's what we're doing. And the reason we think that it's important is because um, one of the biggest costs left in solar is actually the financing costs. Um, purely because of the fact that as an industry, we, we do a very poor job of communicating 
that quality aspect, the, uh, the idea that we understand where the risks are. And of course, if we don't understand as a sole industry where those risks are, it's very, very difficult for us to convince you know, CalPERS or insurance funds um, via securitization routes that this is a really good investment for them to make. And so that's the, the problem that we're tackling. Great, thank you, Rich. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting, we'll have a question. We heard, heard earlier today, we, we heard about tailoring uh, the message to the audience, uh, speaking somebody's language, and I'll, I'll, I wanna ask you a little bit about that because uh, I know with your background and, and the like, uh, it's, it's an intriguing uh, idea of, of how you're communicating with the financial, not the financial markets, but the, uh, the financiers and, the, and that kind of stuff with respect to, uh, to solar. Um, thank you for uh, overviewing uh, your, your projects and your companies. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm thrilled to be here talking with you, uh, and uh, we, we will open it up to the uh, audience in, uh, in a while, but I'm going to ask you some questions first, kind of to, to dive in a little bit on some of the things you do uh, and, and, and what you're doing uh, to, to a greater extent. The first thing, though, that I want to do, and this is really a, a, a panel question, uh, and some of you have talked a little bit about it already, uh, but, you know, I, I have defined innovation uh, as, a, as a applied inspiration, right? So um, it, it's that inspiration moment that then you're taking and, and you're, you're actually putting it into, uh, into effect. And I don't think you can have innovation without that application uh, of that. So you know, I, I'm sure you all had your aha moment, that Newton apple hitting you in the head uh, that, that was the, the basis for that. Johnny, you talked a little bit about that. But if you could, I'd like each of you to just kind of give us the idea a little bit of, of where you came up with the idea for this. Where, where was that aha moment for this? So go ahead. Sure. Um, my aha moment was March 20th, 2003. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, can you be more specific, please? <laughs> it's like 4 p.m. Okay, uh, that's no. good. Uh, so I, 10 years ago, I was at Stanford, and I was an activist. I was very involved with uh, planning the rallies and speaking at the protests, and this was my scene. One of the things that I was very involved with was uh, protesting against this, the upcoming invasion of Iraq. And... Um, you know, it, it sort of a, I had a lot of experience in all this stuff, and as, as that invasion approached, uh, you know, everyone was demonizing the sort of the Bush administration, and, and you know, at that, in that context, I had a chance to have dinner with Paul Wolfowitz, who was, um, you know, organizing, he was the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And I sort of realized, like, ah, this whole, you know, this is a good, nice guy, and like, why are we, why are we demonizing him? Huh? I don't know, this doesn't really, maybe it's not the right approach. And then we had this big protest, and then the next day on March 20th, you know, the day after the largest day of protest in human history at that time, uh, I said, what was the impact that we just had with all this energy? And I couldn't point to anything that we had achieved with that, with that energy. And so my aha moment was, it, it, it doesn't make sense to sort of demonize the opposition and just sort of have this really like emotional but not very results-oriented approach to changing the world. And so I just stewed on that and I began to think, well, you know, where are the decisions being made? It's in businesses. Like, and I had friends who would go to, you know, drive to San Ramon to just yell at Chevron. And like, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't the, the sort of thing that, that I was like, this is not working. Like, how do, we how do we change businesses? You change it through consumer dollars and through money. And, and so that's what sort of evolved into the idea that why don't we just harness consumer power? Instead of using the stick, let's use the carrot of a positive incentive. So that's how Carrot Mob was born. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was going to, good, you've answered the question, so it is the carrot and the stick. It is. Now, we don't have to go down the line for this one, so uh, you guys can just, uh, if you want to, whoever wants to go next, you don't have to, you know, just how, who wants to go next on that? Yeah, um, I, I definitely did have that moment. Um, it, I, I mean, it's not as specific as uh, March 10th of 2003, <laughs> but uh, I was around 12 or 13, and I remember my mom was driving, um, and I remember seeing exhaust emissions coming out of the car in front of me. Um, it was one of those moments where you kind of assume that someone else had already invented it. Um, you know, you think of that app idea and you kind of assume it's already out there. Um, so you, you, you don't worry too much about it. Um, but then a couple of weeks later, I uh, started doing some research and I realized there was really nothing in the field to do any sort of damage control on, on any of our existing systems. Um, so I started doing research on that and I'm, I mean, that was my, uh, my uh, aha moment. Um, but then I had, a, I think, another one when I was around 16 or 17 when I uh, realized that, you know, I was, I was doing, I remember I was doing a lot of research into uh, projects that were coming out of uh, Oak Ridge National Labs in uh, Tennessee. Um, and what I kind of realized was many of these technologies aren't ever reaching the hands of consumers because uh, they work well in the lab. 
um, but they're not scalable. Um, they're not efficient enough for a consumer to use. Um, so um, in, in the essence of the term, uh, and applies for, towards the company, I began to deviate. Um, this, the slogan of the company is deviate, innovate, ecoviate. So I tr try to deviate from the norms of, um, of where the field was going and um, through, throughout the, sus the sustainability model. So uh, we often refer to that, that chasm between development and commercialization as the valley of death. So, uh, yep. so if you guys have heard that. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll take it. Oh, okay. Go ahead. So, um, we started off much, with a much smaller insight. It wasn't really a single day I could point to. Um, but I helped um, to work with McKinsey's solar practice in, their, in the early days of its founding back in 07. Um, but I was based in Asia, and there were about you know, 300 manufacturing companies out there. They're all creating solar panels. And it was funny because every single company had some somewhat plausible way of claiming that they were number one in quality. You know, there's some lab tests in Australia, there's some lab tests in Germany. They could say, we are number one. And it was funny because, you know, sitting there, it's like, it's not possible for everyone to be number one. There's, there's got to be one of you that's doing better. But if you're a buyer in, in Germany or the U.S., you have 50 companies that come to you and say, we're number one. Uh, you know, what's your gut feeling, right? Your, the gut feeling very quickly is, you're all liars. None of you guys deserve any price premium. And that's had a really negative effect on the industry overall because we just don't know where quality is. And it's been very difficult for us to pick up the pieces after that kind of problem. Um, and so there, that's kind of where we come in and we started to see that there's this ability if someone could just take this field data together and just prove with actual statistics that actually there are differences between these panels, here's how you should think about quality, and then kind of extrapolating beyond that problem to think more about the financing issues that result from that kind of understanding. That's kind of how we got started. Okay. John? Oh, um, I think for when I was in seventh grade, I came up with Green Shields and I kind of, um, I took this class um, where we built like pine wood derby like cars, but they were propelled with a little tank of compressed air and you'd pop them and they'd fly down a track. And the teacher taught us that um, the car that would win would be the car that was the lightest and the wheels were aligned um, and the most aerodynamic. And I was kind of really excited by like the aerodynamics and I like thinking just changing the shape, you could make a huge difference in its speed. And so I um, started sketching and drawing and thinking and one day I kind of just was walking home from school and I saw a school bus and I mean you can feel the wake um, that like of air that the school bus displaces and the admissions and it's just something that could be made better and I kind of wanted to make it better. That was a big apple by the way. That was a, so, uh, so hopefully you came out of that okay. Uh, Rich, let me ask you a question. You just talked about your consulting background. Let me, let's uh, dive in a little bit on that. Um, and you know, the, the idea is you're, and, and probably because of that, you were conditioned to, to, to be able to tailor the message and tailor the, the product to different, um, uh, to different audiences. But tell us a little bit about how you work to tailor uh, the work that you do on the financial ROIs and that with respect to uh, the solar uh, uh, choices that, that, uh, that companies can invest in, how you speak their language. We've heard about that, so how do you work that to speak the language for, that they need to hear in order to make the decisions that, that you want them to make? Yeah, that's absolutely been one of our biggest challenges to figure that out. And I suspect that a lot of companies out there have their version of this kind of translation issue. I mean, for us, you know, when we started this thing, we thought we were starting a solar company, right? It's a solar data company. Um, but very quickly we discovered that actually the, the true needs that the market had was actually they needed a, a solar financing data company. And so they needed to make that translation between a solar guy and thinking just about the energy aspects of it to thinking about how does the energy impact the actual financing of these deals. Um, that's kind of been one of our challenges. I think that one of the ways we've addressed this is by uh, six months ago I just moved to New York City. And that's something you can do when you're in your 20s and don't have too many obligations. Um, but, you know, getting a chance to actually meet these ratings agencies, the banks, the lawyers, all these folks have already figured out how to do this for solar, and um, we're trying to now securitize these assets. So there's a very established vocabulary in how to think about this from, from home mortgages, from commercial mortgages, credit cards. And just by immersing yourself in that new type of language, you're able to pick up how these guys think about it. Um, I think that the, the macro thought here, though, is especially coming from consult consulting, this idea that there are very few problems that are truly novel. You know, many times there's going to be problems that have already been solved by someone somewhere out there. And so our job is to find what that best practice is and just 
copy it ruthlessly. And so what, we, what we've seen is that you know, if we want the solar industry to be financed more like home mortgages, well, there's a data company out there for home mortgages. Why don't we create that for solar space? And so that's kind of how we tend to think about this translation issue. You know, it's interesting. I, uh, I talk about building blocks of, of, of sustainability and, and, and realized after doing it, and it was you know, performance, transparency, innovation, and leadership. Uh, and then in thinking about it, really that's no different than any other aspect of good responsible business. Uh, and, and in thinking about it, it, it occurred to me that that's the way it should be. If you're trying to integrate sustainability into to business, you need to follow business models, responsible business models that work. So it's interesting that you're able to do that with respect to the, uh, uh, the, the solar choices in, uh, on the financing uh, side of this uh, uh, case because they speak a specific language, right? So, yeah. Brent, let me turn to you for a second and, and talk to you a little bit about Carrot Mob. Um, clearly, uh, the, one of the incentives for companies that you work with is to drive sales. I mean, without question, it's to drive sales that, uh, uh, and to, to really motivate that mob to buy the product. I guess it's okay to use mob. Is that, is sure. that it's not a pejorative? It's a nice okay. mob. It's, it's a nice. Okay. It's a nice. <laughs> so uh, to to use that uh, uh, that mob to to yeah. to to buy the the products that the companies are are working in, but then to turn around and that company then to invest in something uh, good. So if you would tell us a little bit about the the value that businesses would derive uh, from that marketing side of it. Clearly, they'll have the sales uh, value, uh, uh, but but. Tell us a little bit about how, where the marketing value comes in, if you would. Yeah, well, you know, every business has their own needs and their own carrot, which will, which will move them. Uh, I don't think there's too many CMOs in the, in the audience, but I think if there were, what you'd hear from them in terms of what they're looking for, you'd hear a lot about, uh, oh, we need to be co-creating our brand, you know, interacting with our consumers. We need to be, you know, engaging on social media, and we need to be... Um, you know, just all these buzzwords, like, are we crowdsourcing anything? We need to be crowdsourcing more. Uh, so I think the hardest thing for them to do, though, is be authentic. And, you know, any company, you know, you got you know, Fortune 500 company, how are you going to be authentic and how are you going to seem real to, to people? And, um, you know, so, you know, we've got a lot of great sustainability initiatives. You could put out your press release and then everyone's going to look at it and say, oh, that's great, that's nice, but, like, I know that like that came out of your like your marketing department or whatever like that that's just sort of how it's perceived right so a great Pepsi refresh right that was a great cause marketing innovative thing and everyone's like oh that's really nice but like I know you're trying to sell me Pepsi so what we're trying to do is the problem is that it always is perceived as a top down thing this this is generated by the business and then it, then it's given to you consumer and so what we're trying to innovate on is let's make it a bottom up thing where we go we start with the consumer to say what do you guys care about what are you passionate about and then they say here's what we want and then the brand sort of swoops in as the hero like we will give it to you and then oh, <laughs> like thank you like you listen to our demand like oh you really have our shared oh really have our shared values and, and so I think having that third party that really has that grassroots authenticity is how you um, how you achieve that, that feel. It's a subtle difference, um, but I think it's something where we can really add a lot of value there. Um, it's, it's hard to manufacture that on your own. So, so let me ask you, and by the way, you can tell it's a, it's a summer, right? Blockbusters, movies, he's talking about superhero stuff. But uh, um, uh, this, am I understanding it correctly then, though, that the company, uh, so you, in a way you kind of crowdsource this, right? And, and, and is, the, is the initiative, is the outcome that the company then invests in after they do it and the, and the mob buys, is it tied to, in some form or fashion, is it tied to what you were trying to have produced? Because it seems to me that that would be a key aspect of this, right? That it's not just philanthropy, it's like we're trying to do this, but if we do this, we're able to invest and, and mitigate or benefit or do something else to help that issue. Yeah, you know, there's a million op opportunities to buy something that affects a charity. Sure, get your pink yo plate lid, or you know, you know, there's gr that's great stuff is great, but um, it it lacks that certain sense of like additionality of impact of I caused this to happen, and so we're sort of framing it as like, look, everyone knows that like businesses could do a lot of things, but th you know, these changes about sustainability, this stuff costs money. It's a big investment of. of people and capital, so we're going to show them that we support them. We're going to show them that we really appreciate them and we want to push them further. So a big part of the appeal for consumers is tie that purchase. So they can email like, thank you for, for spending money at X retailer. As a result, this happened 
and like here's the counter of how much money has been spent, and it's 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 going up, and that's exciting, and we're gotta get tell your friends we're gonna get this hit the limit so we can do it. So that feeling is is a little more dynamic than uh, and empowering than uh, just a charity program. Yeah, I mean, we talked about Kickstarter a few minutes ago, and it's interesting because I think part of the value proposition for Kickstarter is that you're investing in to bring new products to market, right? So, so but this is taking, this is taking it further. This, yeah. is actually, this is actually now uh, making, it's not just bringing the product to market, it's actually doing something good as a result of bringing those products to market, right? Yeah, and I would say, if you look at how what we're doing compares with Kickstarter, it's the same in that we've got some passion, you know, a project that's really exciting and people are passionate. What's different is Kickstarter, if you look at all the crowdfunding in the world in 2012, $2.7 billion was spent. And if you look at just one category, you know, like restaurants around the world, that's a couple trillion dollars, like a couple trillion for grocery, a trillion for apparel. So is there a way to harness all that spending that's already happening and use that to fund rather than saying, hey, we got a quirky new font or a, a dance, you know, art project that you can open your wallet. You don't have a budget for your weekly, like, you know, quirky little project on Kickstarter. So we want to harness the existing spending and put it to good use. Great, thank you. Param, let me ask you a question. I'm gonna, I want to talk to you because I, I looked at your, uh, your website with respect to Ecoviate, and I'm, I'm looking here because uh, it, it says that you're creating and you want to create technologies that are not only good for the environment, but that are also cheap, effective, and disposable. And I mean, I think for us here, that, that, that resonates, right? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a key issue. Um, I'm interested in something, though, that, that gets to, uh, and it's a really kind of a two-part question. It's, uh, why these rather than other design criteria? And then, as importantly, what did you discard when you were thinking about the criteria that you would use? Yeah, I think it was a result of um, really trying to understand why green technologies have now taken off um, with consumers. Um, and a proper, a proper analogy that I give is that um, imagine green technologies right now as computers were 40, 50 years ago. Um, they're relatively expensive, or very expensive actually. Um, it's, a, it's a hassle. Um, they're very large. Um, you know, you, the computers were the size of a room. I mean, I, I wasn't around to, to see them, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Did he have to say that? <laughs> um, but, and then companies came in um, and, and made them relatively um, inexpensive. Um, and, and gave a consumer um, a reason to, to use them, right? And um, that's similar to what we're trying to do with green technologies. Um, you know, we want to scale them downwards. Um, almost make it a status symbol for um, a consumer. Um, that right now there's, that, there's a whole stigma that um, someone that is investing in green technologies, you know, he's a tree hugger and he, uh, he's going out of his way to uh, spend that extra dollar or thousand dollars to be more green and save the environment. Um, but it, it really shouldn't be that way. That um, you should be able to go to your gas station and when you're checking out you can uh, buy a device that just fits right onto your tailpipe. Um, is inexpensive to use and, uh, and, and mitigates your, um, your carbon footprint. Um, so, I mean, it was, I think it was a result of trying to figure out why consumers are not taking an, an initiative to uh, be more green and uh, um, do things to increase their efficiency and, uh, um, I mean, I keep on saying this, but do damage control on our systems. So, I'm going to come back to you, but first I want to jump over to Johnny because uh, Johnny, um, you, uh, in, in looking at uh, Green Shield's uh, project, you have a young team of designers and, and, and active members, uh, and then you got uh, you got some uh, uh, older folks that are that are advisors to you. What was the rationale for that? You know, was was that was that intentional that you had a young team and advisors who were older? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, I kind of I, I think that when you're younger, you're you have some creativity that I just think only goes away um, because <laughs> and, and I totally agree. So, yeah. I, I'm sorry I had to ask <laughs> and I think it's it's you don't think about I don't know is it cost effective is it uh, would people like it because I mean ideas some great ideas always start out as crazy and um, if you don't push the boundaries of what you think is possible then I mean how are you going to create innovation and I think that, um, I mean, when I was little, I used to just think a lot and, and come up with designs. And um, I think that some of those are probably like some of the better ideas that I've had. And um, I think 
as you get older, you can kind of you know more. And sometimes knowing less can be an advantage because you don't know what's not possible. And I think that I wanted, um, I guess, my peers to be um, similar and young. And um, I think I, they came to me with, uh, with a passion. And I thought that um, if they have a passion, then why not let them help? And um, I guess that we need mentors because sometimes your ideas are crazy and sometimes they are far out. And um, in order to, I guess, take some of those ideas and turn them into something rational, um, just like, I don't know, a typical brainstorming group, you need some way to kind of funnel that into something that's real and um, something that can be made. So Brent said something earlier uh, about, and, and I, I would refer to it or characterize it as collaborate, not, not just conflict, right, no, not uh, to, um, to do that. And, and when we talked on the phone with you, uh, you also told me about the collaboration that you, uh, Johnny, you and Param were doing with respect to your uh, different uh, companies. So if you could tell us a little bit about that you know, and, and how that came about. Well, um, Param is working on the back end of the, I don't know, it can be a bus, and I'm working on the front end. And so um, we have, I guess, full bus or full car coverage of the aerodynamics and the, the pollution. Yeah, um, it, it was interesting because uh, we, were, we were both at the um, Forbes 30 under 30 event, and uh, we were by far the youngest people there. Um, and I think we kind of gravitated towards each other, um, and we realized that we both had similar passions and were working on similar things. Um, Johnny at the front of the bus, and I was working in the back. Um, so, so, so forgive me, I can't help it. So you had it coming and going, right? So, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, and so this uh, last summer I was, um, I established the company and really wanted to get this thing off the ground. Um, and, and as Johnny said, um, what I've seen with the field is everyone's very close-minded and, uh, you know, they're almost stuck with this whole apply for grants, do research, and then that's it, you don't commercialize anything. So um, I, I wanted the team to be young and uh, youthful and, uh, and just passionate about what they're doing. Um, but then also, um, you know, ha have a good idea of how we're going to get this to the market. And you know, at the, at, the, at the end of the day, you still have to make a profit. So um, that's why I, um, I wanted to work uh, w with Johnny. Um, and so I mean, hopefully we can collaborate and uh, see where things go. Well, I have more questions that I want to ask, but I definitely want to give time for the audience to ask questions of, of uh, this panel. So uh, if we could, uh, can, we, can we open it up and, and uh, have a few minutes of questions from the team? Like I said, I've got some questions, but I want to give you guys the opportunity to ask some. So do we have any uh, questions that uh, anybody that would like to ask? Yes, sir. Back there. So, uh, Thanks very much. This is really inspiring. Uh, I, I work at a university, the University of Minnesota, so I'm really curious, you know, how can universities help turn out more people like you? Uh, I don't think we do a very good job of that sometimes. So I'm curious to hear from the four of you, like, what did you study at university, or if you're still at university, I don't know. Uh, or, or, you know, some of you look pretty young. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, some? But also, you know, like, what, what, did, what did the school get right, and what did they miss? That's the thing I'm more interested in. Like, what could, from your point of view, uh, how could we reboot uh, university education, so it's helping to promote more entrepreneurs like you. So it's a great question, and actually I, I'd like to hear from all of you because you, you have different backgrounds and, and you're approaching things differently, so if you would, it's a, it's a great question. So. Sure, well I was at Stanford and I was always a generalist. I majored in communications, which is a little journalism, a little social science and film and all that stuff. Also had a minor in Latin American studies and I uh, I just liked that I was able to dabble in a lot of different topics. Uh, and then after that, I, you know, I worked, I directed a documentary film, I worked at Google in advertising briefly, I worked for, as a game developer doing, doing high-tech urban adventure games for big companies, and ended up with, with what I have now, which is ridiculous. So th there's no sort of major that, that was what led here, and it just, by, by having that tour around activism, I started to understand how change makers think. And then, you know, adding on, working with developing games for brands like you guys, that's how I started to think how, how they think. And it, 
it worked out. So for me, I would say the only thing which I, I regret not doing more is was, was actually studying business a little bit more. So now I've, I've learned in the startup world that this is my second company I've started. I did a, a solar company as well. So I've, I learned uh, the hard way, but that's one thing I would add to my education. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm currently at Vanderbilt. Um, I'm a, a rising junior. Um, not sure why I'm with credits, but um, I'm studying uh, mechanical engineering and economics. Uh, to focus on corporate strategy. Um, and um, I, I think there's, Vanderbilt's done a very good job of um, creating an, um, an innovation, more of an entrepreneurial environment for me, uh, which I've seen with a lot of my friends um, that go to different schools around the country. Um, I mean, very good schools, but they, they get stuck in academia. Um, and the incentives for the universities is a lot different than what Vanderbilt has provided me. Um, you know, you, you have to provide that student that's going out of his way to um, do something great with um, an environment to, to succeed and to throw off ideas um, and, and not be worried about, you know, what's going to happen with your IP or, um, you know, how, how are you going to market this while you're still in school. Um, and so, I mean, if you, you just can't get stuck with what most universities are focusing on, which is, you know, applying for grants um, and, um, and try, trying to grow the name of the university rather than the projects it itself? Um, so I um, just graduated high school, so I haven't done the whole college thing yet. <laughs> um, although I, I've worked in universities, um, I, in all my summers during high school I spent researching. Um, and I think that um, what I've learned in high school is I think kind of learning what you want to do early and I guess um, I mean, also having a, a broad education, but kind of um, figuring out what you really like um, is something that I, th I think, I mean, I really uh, enjoyed, like being able to take at my high school, I was able to take um, engineering courses, and so I was able to learn um, like CAD programs and be able to actually contribute to um, the, the students that were at, um, Northwestern University helping them actually, I mean, design um, the Green Shield. And I thought um, that was really, um, that was really great for me. And next year I'll be attending Columbia University in New York. In, in mechanical engineering, right? Yeah, in mechanical yeah. engineering. Okay. Rich? Sure, sure. So I think that, um, echoing Param's point, I think that integration with the real world is extremely important. So I went to Georgetown's Foreign Service School, so I suppose I'm supposed to be a diplomat. And uh, I went to the, um, the embassy in Beijing for my junior, then to going to senior year summer. And it was a disenchanting experience. And that's how I learned that that's actually not where I want to go. But I really do wish that at some point before then, you know, Georgetown's in DC. Like, why had I not exposed myself to those kinds of folks beforehand so I could learn how this thing actually works? I mean, conceptually, I could understand that international relations was really interesting. There's all these ways of thinking about this problem, but it's actually so far removed from the actual day-to-day, -day, just as with all of our jobs, really. Um, the ideas that really drive us to work aren't necessarily things that we actually end up doing from a nine-to-five basis. And so having more of that kind of exposure just allows you to then understand real-world problems and, of course, start to design real-world solutions for them. No, it's interesting. Two of you have uh, diverse backgrounds, right, uh, educationally and then uh, work experience as well. Two of you are very specialized. Uh, for, for, the, for the record, I, my undergrad was mechanical engineering as well. We, we, we talked about that. And um, what's interesting about this is that that can be a very, and will be, is a very specialized field, right? So, but yet you, you both have not lost the, um, the ability to answer the question, what for, rather than always answering the question, what if? Right? Because what if is a very limiting, that's a very limiting question if you haven't answered what for beforehand. Um, so what's interesting uh, for me uh, with respect to all of your backgrounds is the fact that, that it is diverse, it's different fields. And I think that if you uh, polled the audience, that would probably be the case as well through the, uh, through the audience as well, that every, all of us come from a, a diverse background. And, and frankly, I, I actually, I think that's a, that's a positive. I think it's a positive because you're able to, you're able to bring those different perspectives and different experiences to answer some of these questions in, in different ways. Um, any other, uh, do we have other questions? Ann? GE, by the way, so. 
I mean, it's funny. We were actually just ch chatting about that right before this this panel. Oh, so the question was, no. they were every they were all in. I guess they were all in the disruptive uh, technology panel before. And was what did they hear that was that they thought was interesting, interesting and different? Yeah. I mean, this is probably just symptomatic of our generation's um, love for Google. <laughs> but we thought the stuff coming out of uh, Jim's mouth was just really incredible. We need some glass. <laughs> Yes, I mean, we want, want pairs of glasses. That's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I thought it was interesting. We talked about um, 3D printing. And I mean, I've, there's so many capabilities out there that um, some of which we, I mean, we don't even know yet. Um, and you know, 10 years ago, there was a shift that anyone can be a programmer. You, know, you can go online and learn to program. Now, with 3D printing, anyone can be an, an inventor. Um, you know, if you have an idea, you can, you can actually make something tangible out of it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see where the field's going and how that, um, where like the, the layman can do anything these days. Um, it was just fascinating to see what, what some people were working on in the, in the talk. Yeah, I thought I'm, it's kind of um, making inventors have the same ability that I mean, software designers can do with 3D printing and just being able to click a button and with some simple skills of being able to use CAD programs, you can just create it. And as it keeps getting better and better, I think I mean, it's the future's looking better and better for hardware designers. I'm so disruptive, I wasn't at that panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have any other? Oh. Hi, I'm, I'm Kirsty from uh, Hewlett Packard. So I have, I have a question about the school buses. And forgive me it's a very, if a very ignorant question. I'm from London. Um, and a few years ago, uh, the city of London decided to get rid of its old-fashioned route master buses, you know, the, uh, the red double-deckers that you could jump on from the back. They're always in all the films. And they got rid of them because of environmental reasons and health and safety reasons. Health and safety, of course, very easy to sort of fall off when there's a, like an open door. <laughs> and they didn't like the fact that people tried to jump on them, right, running along the street. So that wasn't a great idea. But also they were very old diesel engines and, and they were contributing a lot to the pollution in, in the city. So I suppose my question is, you know, and they overcame that controversy and replaced them with gas buses. So, so while I, I uh, you know, I'm very impressed with, it, with your idea and, and your proposal, surely the future should be of a completely different bus design. Yeah, um, well, I mean, the current school bus um, system is, I mean, School buses from the 1950s and today look virtually identical. And I don't think that's stayed the same with anything else other than doorknobs. And, um, <laughs> and so um, with green shields, we're, I mean, school, bu school districts can't really afford to replace their buses like very uh, I mean, often, less than, I mean, once every like 10, 15 years. And the current options are, I, School bus, I guess, um, designers should start bringing in efficiency as school buses are traveling longer distances at higher speeds because um, I think when they brought in safety and the ability to fit in as many kids as possible, they came up with a school bus, and that's quite a novel idea. And so I think if aerodynamics and efficiency were added into that, that they could do some amazing things. And the current offerings, such as, um, like, there's a hybrid electric um, bus, and it costs more than double. And so no school district is going to do that if they can't afford to buy books. And so um, it's, it needs to be a cost-effective solution. And so the Green Shield is kind of, um, it's just retrofitting old school buses that already exist. And hopefully in the meantime, um, as school bus designers are brainstorming and coming up with like super efficient buses, it's, um, reducing their costs and potentially um, directing money, who, I mean, redirecting money that would be spent on diesel, which just gets burned up um, into better teachers and, I guess, more funding for schools. Great. Param, I had a question for you, but I think I actually want to ask it uh, for the full panel. Uh, I'm disrupting, guys. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, you wrote a blog post that was talking about uh, recognition versus personal reward. Uh, and the difference therein, and I was intrigued by that. And uh, and for the record, when I told him I'd read that, he said, "Thank you for reading his blog post." And that's where we look for commonality. I said, "Well, good, because we everybody that writes blog posts wants 
we, we want to know that people are reading what we write. But I think I'd like to ask the, the, the panel here, uh, you know, for you, is there, uh, all of you, is there a difference between that for you, that personal reward versus recognition? And, and is that something that, that motivated you, you know, to, to do what you're doing? Yeah, so I, you can start, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there definitely is. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason I said that was I was excited that I found my one reader <laughs> of my blog, so. Um, you have that. So. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, the, the purpose behind that was that I had recently gone to a, um, a Mensa meeting. Um, I was fortunate enough to join Mensa when I was a lot younger. Um, and you know, they, they, it's a group of people that sit around talking about how smart they are and how like, they've won this X, Y, and Z. Um, but I mean, I really saw there was, it was a group of such smart people, but have really not done anything substantial. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, you can, there's a difference between talking and actually creating and doing. Um, and there's like that, that dichotomy in our society that we, we can talk about designing something or talk about, you know, curing cancer, but until it actually happens and someone steps up and says, you know, I'm crazy enough to think I can change, that can change the world, um, that progression is not going to take place. Any, anyone else? Any thoughts on that? Uh, so. You know, I started off with this idea in my head, like, this is a problem I think exists and I want to solve it. And it was sort of much more of a sort of altruistic sort of a approach to it. Um, and then once this movement started growing, I sort of had this additional, like, pressure from all these people who were like, lead us, you know, make it so. Uh, and then, um, and at first we tried to do this actually as a nonprofit and then, long story. But anyway, it's not legal. We don't have a charitable purpose because IRS sees us as sales and marketing. So we switched to for-profit, and now we have investors and uh, sort of all, all these other sort of motivations. And now, of course, I have a, you know, hey, yeah, let's make let's make a gazillion dollars too. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, it's nice though for me because I feel like I see a lot of entrepreneurs who do something for the money, and they they just give it everything they have, and they know if it doesn't work out, they're going to be like that failed. And I feel like. I have this, this extra sort of gas tank where like, imagine that this doesn't work out and I run out of gas, like, I still have this other like, motivation, so it, it still will have been worthwhile. So it's a nice sort of extra layer of, of motivation. Yeah, it's interesting. I see a corollary between that and what we do often, which is uh, you started out with, the, as you said, the altruistic uh, um, uh, intentions, but yet now there's a reward aspect with respect to, from a business standpoint as well. So you're, again, you're, you know, it, it's, it's aligning it to, uh, to, to, to in, a, in a way, you're aligning that, that ethos that you had to the, to the business itself. Yeah. Um, I definitely wanted to have, uh, if we have more, any more questions? Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Hi, Kara Hurst. I, I'm just curious, Parham, you, you said one of your design, design, design criteria, excuse me, were, was it that it was disposable? I'm curious about that. Just you know, there's a lot of conversation here about end of life on products and the sustainability of the life cycle of products. And so, why is that important to you? Yeah, um, I, I think we added that. Um, that was the very last criteria that we added, um, and it was because, um, especially with our exhaust filter, um, you know, we want a consumer to go out and, and, and buy that filter, just attach it onto their exhaust, um, and then we, we don't want the consumer to have uh, um, a burden to have to go, um, go recycle it or even take it off their exhaust and take it inside to throw it away. Um, so I mean, we're designing the filter to be completely disposable that um, it, it dissolves itself out um, at, at, after the end of the, its period. Um, and we're designing it in a way that the, the resulting, uh, the pH of the material being uh, disposed is, uh, complies for uh, EPA standards. Um, and so it's just adding that extra um, criteria that would just make it easier for um, a consumer to use, um, but I mean, the, there's other technologies that that, that would apply for. Um, we we think that if we can, you know, use a more inexpensive material um, that is more disposable, um, you you kind of take away that turnaround time between uh, the manufacturing and the usage, and then when it gets thrown away. Any other questions? Oh, yes, sir. So maybe this is a bit more for Johnny or Param, but maybe for the other two also, kind of looking back. So uh, you're in a room full of very large corporations, um, and you're at sort of the beginning of your careers. Uh, what would you look for in large companies? Is that something that you would never touch? Or would you say, you know what, if a company's like this, I'll go work for them and take my energy and scale at the large corporate level? 
Well, um, I think, I mean, seeing kind of how it's done now and kind of seeing how um, I wish things could be um, is kind of different. Uh, but I think, I, I think that um, that's kind of why uh, I want to be an entrepreneur. I kind of want to, I don't know, um, change certain things. But I think that there are some companies, and I think many of them who are here, that have a very innovative approach. And I guess the reason that we're sitting here um, in the first place is to kind of see what, I guess, we would think or what we would want to change. Um, and so I guess that it isn't um, that, uh, I don't know, scary um, because it, these, I mean, the companies that are in the room are kind of trying to learn and trying to change. And um, I think that certain companies um, really, I guess, have uh, their core at innovation. And I think that those are the kind of companies that I would um, want to work for. Now, by the way, it was a very good question. You saw my notes, because I had something similar to that for what they could, what they could provide to large companies. If I could, very quickly, We've got just a couple of minutes left. If you would each take that, because I've got one other question I want to ask you, which will be just a one or two word answer. So, uh, Brent, uh, so large companies, what do you, you're working with large companies, right? Yeah, so. I'm already, yeah, call me. Call me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's, I, I love seeing companies where they can foster a culture of entrepreneurship. Um, and, you know, you could imagine like concepts like the lean startup, which is, you know, what, we eat these ideas for breakfast in Silicon Valley, and uh, it's great to see the extent to which that stuff can spread. Um, but yeah, I, I think that w my particular project that probably involve, it belongs as an independent uh, thing. <laughs> yeah, I think there's an interesting, um, interesting source of innovation in startups rather than these big companies. Um, I mean, I, can, I think I can speak for Johnny and me that um, we think that we can be a prime source of innovation for, um, for these big companies that already have existing distribution channels. Um, so, I mean, we can implement technologies that um, maybe a big company wouldn't have thought of because they've been you know, around for 40, 50 years and have been um, creating the same type of products and have, have had the same mindset. Um, so, I mean, we definitely think there's, a, there's room to work together. Um, and it's not, I mean, it, it, something like social and, on, and environmental change should not be something that's cutthroat and uh, you know, everyone's in it for themselves because at the, at the, at the uh, end of the day that um, you know, we, we all have to work together to meet that ultimate goal of being more um, eco-conscious and uh, um, make a social change. Yeah. Rich? Yeah, I mean I think that I'll start with the observation that it's just very hard for a large company to, be, to maintain that focus on mission and then even if you are focused on that mission of course being able to communicate to every single person on the team um, you know, for our teams, because we have such small teams, it's actually very, very easy. We know exactly why we're going to work that day. And we're going to work on this thing, which is going to let us do this thing. And in three months' time, hopefully, we'll still be around. You know, it's very, very laser-like focused that way. And I think that that's something that's it's harder to do when you have a very large organization. The inertia takes, takes over, in a, in a way, right? So um, I have, uh, we have a few, a little bit, just a few seconds left. I want to ask you guys a question that, the part of the title for this was Innovators and Disruptors. And I've listened to you, uh, we've talked on the phone, we've, we've had this conversation today. I'm interested from each of you. What do you, I mean, the question is, do either of those descriptors, do they apply to you, do you think? And if so, which one, or what, what, what describes you in your mind? Are you an innovator, are you a disruptor, or are you something else? And I'll just throw it out to the, to the panel. Yeah, I'll start with that. So I mean, I think, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we, what we're doing is very innovative in solar. But I mean, what I tell our team is, look, the, the best practice is already out there. We just need to figure out how it was done and replicate it for our industry. So I don't really see us as necessarily either. So give us a word. What are you? Uh, copier? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would have said integrator. How's Fair that? Fair enough. OK, OK. But, the, but anyway, OK. Sure. Uh, oh. Johnny? Well, um, I think that uh, I think we need to innovate to disrupt because I mean, Green Shields—it's an innovation to, I guess, make school bus uh, engineers make better school buses, and I think it's technologies um, that kind of push people to um, change is, I guess, something positive that.
creates a positive disruption. Okay. Yeah, so this is me doing my own little uh, self-marketing. Um, I, I would class my, myself not as a uh, disruptor, but a, a deviator, innovator, and eco-viator. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I definitely have the heart of a disruptor, but um, I, you know, I think of disruption as like there's some incumbent and they're going to feel the pain, but like what we're doing is so like win, 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 you know, that I, I feel like we're sort of just, there's a void now and we're going to offer a solution for, for these different groups, so that's why I would say innovative. Yeah, it's great. Um, listen, I don't know about you, but I, this was great conversation for me uh, in, in light of what we've had here before. So if we do nothing else, if we could, could we give them a hand for, for all the great work they're doing?